Hi. How y'all doing? My name's Haley, if you don't know me, and I make memes on the Instagram account ghosted underscore 1996 because my first account without the underscore was deleted for hate speech against men. And I apologize for the janky setup I have going on. I'm filming on my MacBook webcam with a ring light because I can't film on my phone because the microphone's broken. And actually that's because I spilled water on the charger and then when I went to plug it in, it warned me and it said, don't plug in your phone, you could break the microphone. And I said, fuck it, we ball. And now the microphone's broken. So I have no idea how that happened. So I'm not gonna give a super long explanation about why I was gone. Basically I got COVID, long COVID, and then got diagnosed with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, actually amended from a previous diagnosis of bipolar one. And we all know I have premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD. Disclaimer that I have no formal education on any of these subjects and all of my knowledge is a result of a feverish search for understanding that I may or may not gain in the end. So, let's get into it. In my video on famotidine, I explain that the studies I first found that sparked my hope in it were actually in schizophrenia with significant efficacy in positive and negative symptoms. Now I realize that famotidine has such a profound effect on me in part because I have a schizophrenia spectrum condition and that H1 antihistamines like fexofenadine did help my PMDD but ended up worsening my psychosis long term because of the way that they interact with dopamine. So I just wanted to put that out there that I'm not taking regular antihistamines anymore. I'm just using famotidine. So famotidine seems to have a rapid acting antidepressant effect, at least in certain populations. There are the rare other compounds that have quote unquote rapid acting antidepressant effects, which is the term used in research. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just what I have the most experience with. The ketamine, which I have an extensive relationship with. Psilocybin, which I have an even more extensive relationship with. Nicotine, which I'm in an abusive relationship with. And the active ingredient in coffee syrup, dextromethorphan, which I'd rather not discuss my association with, and CBD, which I have a beautiful, loving, healthy relationship with. Again, there are other compounds that fit under this category, but I'm not going to be doing a complete overview, just trying to connect some dots within my own experience and hopefully for others. What all these compounds have in common is that they seem to alter the balance of GABA and glutamate in the brain which are the two main excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters, essentially in control of maintaining communication in the brain, both between individual synapses between neurons and coordinating all of this activity globally throughout the brain. This is called functional connectivity because these networks are not physically adjacent, but they work together for a functional purpose. Glutamate allows your brain to communicate with itself and GABA essentially prevents this communication from turning into a disorganized mess. Ideally, there is a balance of plasticity promoting glutamate and inhibitory GABA, allowing the brain to form and sustain the strength of new connections. When your brain doesn't have the right balance of GABA and glutamate to expand and edit and expand and edit again, all this activity in your brain and integrate it into a holistic picture of functional connectivity, a lot can go wrong. These networks are active even when you're asleep, and it is increasingly recognized that alterations in their organization contributes to all types of disorders and diseases, from depression to ADHD to Parkinson's to Alzheimer's. One of the most implicated networks is the default mode network. To put it simplistically, the default mode network is the self-monitoring system. Highly active when thinking about the self, how the self is perceived by others and how others interact with the self. Least active when you're doing something like focusing intensely on a task. This is also what certain psychedelics can fundamentally alter with lasting benefit. Differences in the baseline activity of this network are highly correlated with overall happiness, self-concept, and the ability to dynamically shift into new patterns of thought. Conditions like depression and PTSD are associated with a hyperconnectivity of this network, and especially involving regions of the brain like the amygdala. There's a lot to this, obviously. It's a very complex cascade. This is a gross oversimplification. But the common denominator in rapid-acting anti antidepressants, at least the ones that I'm going to be covering, seems to be altering functional connectivity through glutamate receptors in the synapses of neurons, particularly AMPA and NMDA receptors, which control almost all excitatory activity in the central nervous system. Both receptors have a direct effect on, synap on synaptic plasticity, which is basically your brain's ability to change its own patterns of activity like the volume at which neurons communicate with each other. There's a close relationship between these glutamate receptors, GABA 
receptors in the mammalian target of rapamycin, which is a kinase that controls many levels of cellular homeostasis. In the brain, the mTOR pathway is integral for maintaining long-term synaptic plasticity. Famotidine, as mentioned in my first video, has an off-target effect at the A7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor in the vagus nerve, which has a homeostatic anti-inflammatory effect throughout the entire body. As we know, it's potent enough to treat cytokine storms in COVID, which is how this was originally discovered. And at first I was really going hard for the immune hypothesis of PMDD, which I think is definitely still part of the picture because these receptors also play a part in neuroinflammation and immune cells in the brain like microglia play a huge part in synaptic pruning. And my joint pain is at its worst when my PMDD is at its worst, but I think that's too complex for me to parse out. So, there's another compound that activates the A7 receptor, and it's inside your soon-to-be illegal disposable bit vape cartridge right now, if you live in California. I'm fine. Okay, so nicotine activates the A7 receptor, but what does this mean? Well, we know that a huge percentage of schizophrenics use nicotine products, and this might have more of a biochemical purpose along the lines of prescribed medication, like a legitimate self-medication phenomenon. Obligatory disclaimer, do not start smoking. Nicotine's effect on cognition in healthy individuals has been linked to altering activity of the default mode network, but it might work in a unique way in schizophrenia to, to treat core symptoms of the disease. There's a gene mutation associated with both having schizophrenia and being a smoker, which causes defects in the A5 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor that leads to hypoconnectivity in the prefrontal cortex, so not enough connections happening there. There's sluggish brain activity, improved within two days and normalized within a week when chronically exposed to nicotine. So it was clearly compensating for a predetermined genetic defect. Why this is, I don't know exactly, and it's always more complex than one answer, especially because nicotine affects most of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. But since famotidine does a similar thing in schizophrenic patients, it leads one to believe it could be the A7 receptor in part. A7 receptor is especially prominent in the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, where it's expressed on GABAergic and excitatory pyramidal interneurons, along with AMPA and NMDA receptors. Interneurons are the neurons that connect different regions of the brain. So it's possible that the A7 receptor, when activated chronically by nicotine, induces synaptic plasticity by altering AMPA receptors and mTOR signaling, allowing the brain to compensate for the hypoconnectivity caused by the disease. Interestingly, nicotine is contraindicated during radiation therapy because its effects on the mTOR pathway are strong enough to protect cancer cells from death. In animal studies, nicotine can help potentiate and sustain the antidepressant effects of ketamine. And when nicotine alone was combined with an AMPA receptor, it had a significant antidepressant effect, meaning that there's possibly something synergistic happening in the same system. Ketamine is an incredibly complex drug, and I'm not trying to do an overview on the pharmacology of very complex drugs because there are entire channels that do that. Ketamine was created as an alternative to anesthetics that induce respiratory depression with a novel mechanism at the NMDA receptor, creating unconsciousness without impairing breathing. It was discovered very early in its use that it had antidepressant and anti-PTSD anti properties, but this possibility and the research being done at the time was shelved along with the research on many other drugs during the war on drugs, only to be revived quite recently with great effect. At first, it was thought that the effects were mediated solely by its NMDA antagonism, but other compounds with an identical mechanism did not produce equivalent effects. So it's possible that ketamine treats depression by disinhibiting GABAergic interneurons, allowing a storm of glutamatergic activity that allows the formation of new dendritic spines, which receive excitatory input from neurons and also express AMPA and NMDA receptors. Spines are like anatomical memory storage and they can be depleted by stressful experiences. Ketamine can reverse this deficit with a sustained effect that peaks at 24 hours, possibly by rectifying the AMPA-NMDA ratio through the AMPA-MTOR pathway, restoring GABA and glutamate homeostasis and altering connectivity in the default mode network particularly, which can last in some cases as long as several weeks. Interesting note is that these specific GABAergic interneurons activated by ketamine 
They're called parvalbumin, I'm just gonna call them PV interneurons, are expressed in response to progesterone, making ketamine treatments potentially much more, much less effective depending on the phase of the menstrual cycle at which it's administered. These studies were done in rodents after noticing differences in brain activity after being administered ketamine, depending on the estrus phase of the rodents. And this variability is found in humans too, with men generally having more of a reliable antidepressant effect from ketamine. Meaning when progesterone is high and the rodents are administered ketamine, their brain lights up like a Christmas tree. And when estrogen is high, the response to ketamine is less sparkly because these PV interneurons were not being activated. I've, I've had quite a bit of experience with ketamine therapy, and I'm not gonna go into this because I could do a whole video on it, but there's definitely a huge difference depending on what phase of my cycle I do it at. In animals, CBD has been found to decrease the psychomimetic, meaning psychotic-like, and hyperlocomotor, like excessive motor activity, effects of ketamine while potentiating its antidepressant effect. A similar synergy that was found with nicotine and ketamine. CBD again is highly, highly complex. I love CBD. And I'm just focusing on the part of the pharmacology that I believe lends it its rapid antidepressant effect, which is activation of the AMPA mTOR pathway and its modulation of functional connectivity. And CBD is also being investigated as a treatment in schizophrenia. CBD might seem overblown because like everyone and their mom is using it and talking about it on Facebook at this point, but it's absolutely not. It's a compound with a lot of therapeutic utility and I use it every day and I have noticed a definite difference in all of my symptoms when I don't use it. So to connect this back to famotidine, I believe all of this could be the reason why famotidine has such a profound effect in PMDD, because it allows the brain to enter a highly plastic state and compensate for the disruptions in connectivity caused by hormonal fluctuations specifically. This could also be why both I and others notice famotidine is far more effective when taken prophylactically before symptoms occur or right as they start to occur instead of after things are really bad because then putatively it's more difficult to restore normal brain function and connectivity the, long, the more degradation of these networks has occurred. And I truly believe that PMDD could cause a similar kind of disconnectivity that schizophrenia symptoms cause, and this is why this condition is so disabling. I'm not saying that PMDD is a form of schizophrenia, but that I believe it also could be a disorder of connectivity with the disruptions in network organization being induced by hormone fluctuations specifically, causing extreme shifts in energy, mood, cognition, executive function, physical health conditions, etc. It's happening on a neurological level, especially when you have both schizophrenia and a hormonal sensitivity. As we know, PMDD is associated with a genetic mutation that causes extreme sensitivity to hormonal fluctuations. This could also explain why some people with PMDD report psychotic-like or manic-like symptoms without an alternate diagnosis to explain these symptoms. GABA and glutamate imbalances are well known to contribute to the symptomology of PMDD. Anything disrupting this balance can really mess with my symptoms. I can tell you that when my catatonic symptoms are at their worst, which are treated with benzodiazepines to restore inhibitory control of brain connectivity, my PMDD symptoms are also at their worst. And famotidine helps all of this for me. So here's an excerpt from a, from a text message that I sent to my friend about how it feels for me when it kicks in. I can feel the neural network shift and suddenly a less rigid one is available to me. One where I can even create new pathways and I literally feel my brain expand. But simultaneously, the old one is still active in the background, but dimmer. And I can run a program on both of them at the same time. And I actually have no choice because they're both my brain and the old one is trimming away the dendritic branches of the new one, even as, even as it's creating them fighting back, and I can climb them both at the same time. So to connect this to psilocybin, this is very similar to how I experience microdoses and or mini doses of psilocybin. And many others with PMDD also report um, an acute and sustained restoration of brain function from varying doses of psilocybin mushrooms. They almost feel like similar states, similar in fact to anything that I've found to be deemed a rapid acting antidepressant. The antidepressant and anti-anhedonic effects of psilocybin are actually not mediated by the 5-HT2A receptor as previously thought. 
because the effects are still intact even when that receptor is blocked. Psilocybin potentially works on a synaptic level, maybe through different serotonin receptors, by altering the AMPA NMDA ratio, mTOR activity, and therefore functional connectivity, but in an even more dramatic and long-term and sustained way than some of the other compounds on this list which again is not an exhaustive list or covering every aspect of these substances. We're just beginning to understand how psilocybin and other psychedelics like Ibogaine can cause such sudden and lasting improvement in depression, anxiety, OCD, PTSD, eating disorders, the list goes on. At the most basic level, it's because they're altering the balance of communication in the brain allowing new pathways of thought to form dynamically in a once rigid state of rumination, effectively evening out deepened ruts neurologically and fundamentally altering the way your brain forms and sustains new connections. Psilocybin is associated with dramatic differences in organization of functional networks, particularly the default mode network, and these changes can last years and in some cases maybe a lifetime. This might be why microdoses of psilocybin have such a profound effect on both people with PMDD and without PMDD, because a full trip is not necessary to alter synaptic transmission and the way your brain is fundamentally organized. CBD has also been found to potentiate the antidepressant effect of psilocybin in animals, enough so that this combination of CBD and psilocybin is being patented. Yes, we love patent. Note that CBD actually inhibits the A7 receptor that famotidine activates. And I do notice that I have to take famotidine in the morning and CBD at a later time of day because it can definitely diminish the antidepressant effects of famotidine. The utility of things like psilocybin and ketamine in disorders like schizophrenia are limited because of pluralistic mechanisms that can end up exacerbating symptoms. There's a case report of positive response to ketamine in a schizophrenic patient. I've had very good experiences with ketamine. Psilocybin has also helped to heal the very core of my illness, which is absolutely not everyone's experience and comes with a major risk for exacerbation of symptoms and worsening of your condition. So I consider myself incredibly lucky that I'm able to use this medicine. I was going to go over dextromethorphan, the active ingredient in cough syrup, but I'm a little tired. I'll just say that DXM is being investigated to treat negative symptoms of schizophrenia and it's already approved in combination with another medication that extends its half-life to treat re treatment resistant cases of depression. DXM has mechanisms in common with psilocybin activation of 5-HT1B receptors, and several with ketamine, including NMDA antagonism and activation of the AMPA mTOR pathway, creating a rapid antidepressant effect. Chronic treatment with standard antidepressant drugs like SSRIs, SNRIs, etc. are also associated with modulation of the AMPA NMDA ratio, and it's possible that they have a delayed effect and take several weeks to work because the synaptic level changes occur later as a result of a forced homeostatic effect from the initial mechanism. Fluoxetine, however, directly interacts with the AMPA receptor, which is interesting because it's the only antidepressant that has a consistent enough effect in PMDD that it's actually FDA approved for the condition. Other things like sleep deprivation can change the AMPA and MDA ratio and have a rapid acting antidepressant effect, which is actually one of my favorite old unhealthy coping mechanisms when I was just so fucked in the head. I would stay up for as long as I physically could because at a certain point I would feel completely normal. Transcranial magnetic stimulation can also confer rapid acting antidepressant effects through direct modulation of specific brain regions with very few side effects, leading to lasting alteration in functional connectivity and GABA glutamate homeostasis. Yoga and meditation can also powerfully influence functional connectivity, proving that altered states are not necessary to achieve some of these benefits. We've moved away from the monoamine imbalance theory. You do not have a neurotransmitter deficiency. The synapses that release them just need a little reconfiguration. Your default mode network just needs a little jump start. You're not broken, you're just disconnected from the plastic healing ability of your own brain. But it can learn to do this because it was made to heal itself. I've learned this firsthand, that it's possible to lose your mind several times in fact, and then find it again. Thank you so much for watching all the way through if you did. 
And I wanted to say that I'm including a copy of this script on my Patreon. Well, it starts at $2 a month. And moving, I can do this with the other videos too if you're interested that I've already posted and moving forward. If you want to support me elsewhere, my Patreon is linked below. Until next time, which won't be in five months. I swear it'll be sooner. I have another script ready to fucking go and it's a banger. All right, thank you. Bye.